<laughs> so I'm, I'm doing it. You just can't see. That's it. <laughs> cool. Uh, <laughs> that's me. I am Paul Kinlan. I'm actually really nervous at the moment. Um, I'm on Twitter and all those places, and I've realized I've already made a mistake in my first slide. You can't have spaces in Twitter names. It's, it's underscore. <laughs> so, oh, it's silly. Anyway, should we dive in? Are we good? Yes. Sweet. So uh, another thing I learned before, for the, before, this com like, before this conference, at least, was have short, snappy conference titles, at least, and I chose not to do that. <laughs> it's building web apps of the future today, tomorrow, yesterday, and again, I can't spell Twitter names. <laughs> uh, where's Paul Lewis? Is he in the audience? He was in the audience. He's hiding. Uh, he's taking uh, bets, or now he is at least anyway. For my nervous word, I normally have ers, ums, you knows, right, awesome, all the time. So tweet him, arrow twist, and he said he's got loads of prizes. <laughs> Has he? <laughs> um, anyway, so my talk right, is about building great web applications. Uh, we have a lot of technology inside the browser today. And what I find, and this is kind of like typical, is, I, well, one, I listen to people and I kind of watch what people do all the time. And, you know, I think it's like for me trying to learn and educate myself about user habits and, you know, the police said it was voyeurism and all this type of stuff. <laughs> um, but anyway, I was watching this guy in the train because I come from Liverpool to London all the time. And basically he said to someone, I, I don't use apps on the web, I just don't see the point. I just use it for news and Wikipedia. And I was like... Okay, I mean, maybe that's what's happening now with the movement towards kind of native apps and all this type of stuff is there's this separation of the web is for like documents and functionality is done in apps. And then he went on to Twitter, Gmail, his bank, you know, all these things that we as developers associate with applications. And I still don't know exactly where we're supposed to be with this whole thing, but the idea is that I know we can build great web applications on the web with the technologies that we have today. And I hopefully want to try and show you some of the stuff that is possible. So building apps for yesterday, right? You know, we've had the talks already today about how we should build applications for the web, uh, whether we go with JavaScript, like for the entirety of the thing, whether we go for, say, HTML and kind of just use the tools that we've got and understand the tools that we have completely. Um, so I have this problem, right, is like people are still building web applications for yesterday all the time, right? We do JavaScript with Ajax, they're pretty cool, but fundamentally, there's this problem where we have the client and the server, and we always have to interact with each other. And I think the user kind of expectation of what apps should be is changing. So it's a little bit facetious, but I'm going to say stop building applications for yesterday, right? Try and start to move towards, they say, the, the new world order for applications. So I'm going to say building apps for today. Uh, and I'm realizing I'm speaking really quickly as well, so I apologize. I'm nervous. I'm excited at the same time. Woo! Yes! Um, but actually, building applications for the modern web today is quite hard. It's kind of broken as well, and we've seen some other people say this today. You know, all of our technologies kind of were designed around the time of, you know, when kind of certain programming paradigms were popular. So at the start, you know, like synchronous communication or synchronous APIs were really popular. Local storage, synchronous API, because you, you might not store that much data. And then we got to the point where we tried to get really buttery smooth web applications. So we said, well, these are, there's Paul Lewis. He came in late. <laughs> Tweet him. <laughs> so anyway, sorry. Um, we're building all these applications, and we're basically, the APIs were designed at a point in time when you know, that API kind of methodology was like widespread, essentially. And if you, you see this against like, different uh, APIs, whether it's local storage, synchronous APIs. Then we said, we're going to do asynchronous APIs. And you know, geolocation and Web SQL database, they had this method of doing different types of callbacks. Um, you know, not amazingly consistent, but at least they had on success and on failure and a couple of things like that where you could have nice little closures in line in your code. And then we said, you know what, we're going to go with maybe something called promises, maybe that's going to happen in the future, um, or transactions like on IndexedDB. It's, it's just kind of broken, right? We have different ways of like, doing the same types of things on the web. And it's a pain in the ass. It's a, pro a proper pain when you're trying to build applications on these things. And I have this, like, this little thing here that says date diff. You know, there's a whole load of say, lack of APIs on the web that are built directly into the framework and platform. I think fundamentally because JavaScript was never built to actually build applications from the start, it was kind of done for, you know, animating mouse overs and all those types of things. But we've come really far and we want all this fun, like, functionality and features and everything, but we haven't got the framework and the tools just built into the core platform. And if you want to do anything with dates, data binding, you know, anything that you expect from a modern application, you either have to build it yourself or use someone else's library. And 
I just want it in the platform. So anyway, I'm always negative. I've got like the British petticism, like petticism? What's the word? Pessimism. 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 Oh, pessimism. <laughs> We can actually do some really amazing stuff on the web today, and I want to show you two examples. Um, just to kind of, well, we, I have no internet connection, but I've taken pictures, so it's kind of good. Um, has anyone used WebLab? A couple of people. Uh, if you don't know what WebLab is, basically it's five real world experiments inside the British Science Museum that you can interact with from anywhere in the world. We launched it in June, is it like a beta, because we like doing betas at Google. Um, and then we launched it publicly like this month, just gone. And it's really cool, right? You've got, five different, you've got five different experiments. One is an orchestra with eight different instruments. It's this. And we're actually using really modern features, right? We're not using some of the modern features we're going to talk about today, like offline support, like support and interacting with files. But actually, this is a really advanced web application. It's one of the most advanced web applications that I know. It does 360-degree webcam streaming onto a WebGL texture. It's like really crazy stuff. It uses web audio uh, for synchronizing, uh, what is it? kind of, I can't even think of the word. Like, if you don't do the real world orchestra, you get like the virtual orchestra. It uses web audio and web sockets to synchronize them. It's kind of pretty cool. Um, and then it uses Node on the back end, all these technologies that we're starting to really adopt. And this, for me, is one of the most advanced applications that we see on the web. And then yesterday, and I worked on WebLab, and has anyone tried Jam with Chrome just yet at all? It's pretty cool, right? This is, again, this is the same type of thing that we worked on uh, for maybe about nine months, I think, overall. Uh, and it basically is using two core components. It's using web, well, web audio and web sockets to synchronize state between multiple clients. And you, know, you, don't deliver, you, know, you don't deliver big audio files across the web. You just have the basic audio file, and then you kind of shift the pitch and do a whole lot of really cool stuff. But it's powered by two very simple APIs that have been around for probably over a year, a year and a half. And we wanna, we're doing these because we want to push developers and users to expect more from the web and to be able to do more with the web. And part of my role in these two projects was kind of early stage consultancy to say, this is what you can do, and this is what's going to kind of be quite prevalent on the web in, say, nine months' time, in 12 months' time. And then when they start to finish the project, because I didn't do any of the coding for this, um, as you can tell, it works. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, but essentially, um, my whole role about this now is to deconstruct this entire application and tell developers exactly how we built it and what to expect on the web. And I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> so wait for more talks, at least. So anyway, what do I want from an application, right? I mean, those two were kind of website-y application kind of things. I, I tend to think of applications as things that do stuff. And I want very specific things from my applications. The first and the most important for me is availability, right? Um, being just available for the user whenever they need your application. And we don't see it that often today. And obviously, Andrew Betts has got you know, his awesome presentation showing you the problems that we had with AppCache. You know, we can still actually do some pretty cool stuff with app cache. Uh, interoperability, you know, making two applications talk to each other, especially when they're offline, right? If you're not completely connected, you still want to be able to say, well, I've got an image, and I want to edit it in this image editing application. I don't want to have to go online to deliver the data to that other client. So I want our applications to be a lot more interoperable. And finally, I want basically, as Remy was saying at the start, just experiences that we expect from desktop applications in our web applications. They're possible today in a good large number of browsers. You know, we as developers, we can implement them with very little kind of worry that they're not going to work in other browsers because they're normally additive features. So availability, it's the act of just basically being available and being awesome all the time. That's obviously from my own, di my own personal dictionary. Um, whoa, can you see the red? I can't see it properly. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so why offline, right? A lot of people say, well, mobile applications, you know, they're the forerunners of kind of why we want mobile technology, or off, like mobile offline technology at least. So the question is, you know, should we build it for mobile? Well, yes, because you know, you're taking these devices around and you might not be connected. You know, do you want it for responsiveness, right? I mean, not responsive design, but actually speeding up the download of your assets and the interaction, ty the interaction time with your application. Well, maybe AppCache basically forces all the data into your application or into your, user, into your user's browser and makes sure that it's always available regardless of whether you're online. The benefit being it's really quick to get data from the cache and rather from another website. Well, for me, it's like always being there. You want your application to be there when your user needs you. If you're not there, well, it's a second-class citizen. Then the user says, well, I need to be online to launch this application. Well, I'm not online. I'm not going to launch the application. 
We, always, we already face problem, like problems, maybe with, like, the idea behind Chromebooks is pretty cool. You can always access your, like, you always connected, always access your applications on the web until you go offline. And we're addressing that with a whole, like, load of new offline technologies. But it's very clear that the users want their application, want to feel like they're outside the, like, the confines of the browser, but to always work when they expect them to work. And that's why we're going to talk about offline today a little bit. Um, it's not as in-depth as Andrew's part, so it's kind of cool. Um, yeah, my experiment with, with offline apps. I extensively tested 50 apps on iOS and Android. I say extensively tested. I downloaded the app, which is really annoying. It's like you have to click on the thing and wait, and ah, oh, it's a pain. But then once I downloaded it, I, if I knew the application needed some content, I'd load it up for the first time, kind of scroll through it, download the content, and see what it looked like. And then I'll just pull the plug. I'd go into airplane mode and see how it would work. And oops, wrong way. There we go. And this is some screenshots of applications, mainly on Android, but it's exactly the same on iPhone. Um, there's, it, it kind of falls down into two or three different components, but essentially there's applications that always work, applications well, when you're offline, essentially, applications that load up, download some data, and then they require that data to function, so the Jamie Oliver application needs to download a whole load of videos. Um, and then there's applications which, you know, they need just internet connection all the time. But the way that they deal with it is slightly different. So the Twitter application is pretty cool. You log in, it'll download some data, you'll close it, turn off your data connection, and then be able to access the data that still that you, you, know, you had. You've got an application experience in front of you. Okay, you can't send tweets, but it feels a lot better than, you know, essentially what we have on the web. And then there's other applications, and there's really, really not that many applications that um, require complete online connection all the time. When they do, they're normally things that ask, ask, for, ask for a license check. Um, so, anyway, I did the same experiment with maybe the top 10 or 15 sites, and you'll see why I didn't do any, as many web applications, is because the general experience was this, right? Near enough, every single popular web application, whether it's Google, Gmail, all these things, they just did not work offline. Okay, Gmail's got an offline app, it's a separate app altogether, uses app cache and a whole lot of other things, but the applications that I use every day, they just don't work offline, and it's a horrible, horrible experience. There are some exceptions. Um, there's this, which is really cool for working out time zones and everything. And it's got app cache in, you go to the URL, brilliant, it works. I don't think it was done for the desktop, like the, def like the offline desktop experience. I have this kind of suspicion that it was because they want to be on iPhone and iPad um, and install from the desktop onto your, or install from the browser onto your desktop. And if you're offline and you load an application up from your, what you expect to be a native application launch pad area, well, if you get a 404 or like this error, it's gonna be a terrible experience, right? People aren't gonna bother installing your application, so that's why I think they made this work offline, is so that on mobile it actually works pretty well. Um, and it functions, the only thing it doesn't work with is the tweet button, but if you're offline, you don't particularly care about those types of things. So for me, the, 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 the bigger highlight was like native apps, the way that they deal with it, kind of the offline scenario, they just win completely hands down, right? Developers are building these applications uh, for native apps and we're not. Like I said before, you know, the majority, they work brilliantly offline with no online requirement. You know, they load off of some UI with cache data and a whole load of other stuff like this. And not many of them just fail to work completely. So, the big point for me is that the user is actually kept inside the app experience. You know, even if they do need an internet connection, they're told they need an internet connection to actually do the work. And that is a fundamental difference on the web, for me at least, is that it just feels a lot more cohesive, right? I'd rather have a native application when I'm offline or on my mobile device or my desktop than I would with a web app at the moment, and it's not a nice place to be in. So I started asking developers why, why this happens, right? And the interesting thing was the way that web developers actually treat offline is they treat it as a feature of you know, their application, right? You know, they integrate offline into their application. And the, the problem with that is most people, when they develop their application, they do like this feature towards the end, which is completely outside of when you should be doing these things. You should be thinking about offline at the start. So web developers just tend not to build applications that are supposed to work offline from the start. Whereas if you have a native app developer, well, they don't come with an internet, well, they come, obviously come with an internet connection. They don't come with this idea of downloading all the assets normally from a server to render in the user's screen. All the content is deployed and like, distributed to the client when they install the application. So to actually get some online support in, they have to integrate online in. The offline experience is just baked in from the start. So it's like super easy for them, right? You know, especially if you're doing a Java, like a Java app, 
uh, and you have to capture the exceptions and you get like an exception that says you're not online because you can't access the resource, well, you have to handle that exception, so you might as well prompt the user to tell them they're offline. So it's a lot easier for a native app developer to build offline functionality. And the other part of this for me is that you know, we're not used, as web developers, we're not used to building offline applications. And I think, uh, was it James or, you mentioned about separation concerns? I don't know, I can't remember. <laughs> we were talking about the separation of concerns, basically, where we as web developers, we normally render all the data on the server inside the template and then deliver it out to the client, because actually that's a pretty convenient deployment mechanism and a delivery mechanism. Um, but if you're gonna build, start building offline web applications, you have to just completely get rid of that whole mentality. You have to think about structuring the application for basically saying, we're gonna give you the structure, the content, and like the logic, and then the data is gonna come in separately, whether it's JSON requests or XML HTTP requests. But you have to think when you're starting to build these applications, you have to be aware of the fact that you're gonna change the way you develop applications for the web for this type of application. And I got this little thing about the web is a hodgepodge of APIs that don't quite work together. You'll notice this even more apparently when you start developing offline applications. Um, you know, IndexedDB and all those type of things are generally fine, but you know, you wanna use, I don't know, registered protocol handler and a whole load of other stuff. They normally need online connections. It's, it's, it's hard, right? It's really hard, and we need some good abstractions. But this is the experience I get on a native application, and I want this kind of experience for web applications. It puts the, the problem of not being able to access the application and the resources uh, more in the user's area because we know it's the user's issue at the time. Um, and actually, Chrome Dan Jam does something similar. When we can detect like you're kind of in a weird offline state, we, state, we tell you the fact that you need to either have a better connection, you need to unblock fireport, like firewalls for your web sockets and a whole load of other stuff. So we have, we're starting to get this idea of better, you know, we know you're offline, you know, you need to be online to experience this. The really annoying thing, even though this is a native app, I can't even tell why this needs an internet connection, but at least, you know, when I'm offline, it tells me I need an internet connection, and we just don't get that on the web. Um, yeah, app cache hints. Listen to Andrew Betts and Jake Archibald way more than me. Um, but generally, prefer client-side templating, right? I've built a lot of offline-enabled applications. Prefer client-side templating. Server-side templating just doesn't work for you. Avoid HTML5 history. Um, everyone likes HTML5 history because it keeps a, like a, like a normal, sane URL inside the browser. Um, but unless you've got a good workaround, if you refresh the page, say you, say you change the URL and you refresh the page, um, that isn't in the app cache. That, that new URL isn't in the app cache, so it's an offline experience by default. So I tend to prefer on hash change, especially for applications in this, in this manner. Um, put web fonts into app cache, that's another one. Um, because if you don't do that and you're like me with this presentation, which is why I have to have a phone on sometimes, um, the web fonts won't load and your application will just be blank, especially in Chrome, because uh, that's the way we handle fonts until they're loaded. They'll just be blank until it throws an exception and error. And you know, if you're doing things like uh, analytics, you need this network proxy pass-through. If you don't have that, you, know, you won't be able to access any resources. It's a horrible thing to say, you say network star, but it's so much easier for you as a developer to do. Um, and obviously, once your application's in the user's client, you need storage. And we, we already know the problems with local storage and the inconsistent, in, inconsistent support between WebSQL and IndexedDB. And the in, inconsistent support between index database across different versions of browsers and different versions <laughs> and different types of browsers as well. So the easiest thing to do for offline storage, you know, seriously just use a different, like a library and not the raw native, like the raw native APIs. It just abstracts it a lot easier, makes it a lot easier to actually just build applications. You don't want them to spend time just faffing about with these APIs. They're just, they're horrible. <laughs> um, interoperability, right? So I've done like a lot of talks about kind of uh, building applications which talk to other applications entirely in the client side. And you know, there's no app as an island, right? If you don't have data going into your application, well, it's not really much of an application. If you don't have data coming out of your application, well, you know, there's not much that you can do with it. It might just be a game or something, or you know, something that just does some calculations which you'll kind of take out. So ideally, you want to be able to get data into your applications and data out of your applications easily. So we had this idea of web intents, and I had a whole talk, I'm not joking, a whole talk today about web intents, and we pulled it out of Chrome. <laughs> it's not in Chrome anymore. Um, and I don't have anything else to talk about. That's the... <laughs> no, no, seriously, I mean, any questions? I mean, I'm not joking, we, we pulled it out last week and I haven't had time to... I'm joking, not questions yet, don't be silly, but loads. <laughs> right, so, we do have some kind of other technologies at least, and you know, register protocol handler, we probably know about this one, but the idea of saying, my application can handle mailing 
uh, you know, handle the mail to links, basically. Uh, it's, it's okay, it just doesn't work very well with offline applications, right? You know, the reason why is because you tend to have to deliver the data to a URL in a query string, which is because of the way most people do it. Um, you deliver, like, the email and the URL and a whole load of other stuff to the user, and it just doesn't work offline with AppCache properly because your, my pull.kinlan.me might be AppCached, right? I might have a whole load of stuff AppCached, but what happens with the AppCache protocol is, well, it says, well, you know, anything after a query, anything with a query string is actually technically a new page. So you can be online, send a couple of emails, you know, send maybe for a month or so, so just keep sending emails 10 a day, um, which is kind of cool. You know, I send emails through my, kind of my Gmail client or whatever. Um, you get to the point where you're offline, you try and send a new email, well, the, the query string is treated as a brand new URL, which won't be in the app, in the app cache, right? So if you've clicked on a brand new mail to link on the, on the web page and it's got, you know, Paul Kinlan at google.com and you've never emailed me before, well, that won't be in the app cache, so it won't load. It's just, that's just how it works. It's, a, it's, it's not great. You can do some things to work around it. But then the, the, the best thing is if you update your application and change the version number for the manifest, every single email that you've sent will be a brand new unique URL which the browser's gonna say, well, these are all in my app cache group, and the user was online, and I added them to the app cache. I'm gonna go and download every single one of these URLs. So if I've sent 1,000 e <clears throat> emails, well, I'll get 1,000 hits on my server. It's just pretty crazy, and you have to work around the fact that you, know, you can use the query string. You might use the hash and a whole load of other stuff, but you have to be aware of the fact that this really does not work very well offline. Um, and also, you can create your own brand new schemes, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the idea of creating brand new schemes, uh, it's hard, don't do it, that's the, the basic reason why, and I learned a lot with WebIntense around this, and I'll tell you about that in a second. The second is register content, register content handler. I want my application to open the user's images. If the user basically double clicks on an image on the desktop, you know, I want my application to be there, I want my application to be in the list, and have the user say, well, open with Paul's amazing web audio image viewer. Audio, man, I've not paid attention to what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but the same problem is, it doesn't work offline very well, right? You can build applications that use app cache and will be generally available, but you've gotta be really acutely aware of the fact that this, you have to develop your application slightly differently, manage the, the URL that you send the data to differently as well. And you've also gotta remember, you're not delivering data, you're delivering a URL to the client, especially in this case. You deliver the URL to the client, so if you're behind a firewall, for instance, and you know, you've got a secret document which you want to open up in your you know, kind of simple web-based image editing application. If the server for that application can't hit your server, it can't load the data. There's a whole load of issues around these types of APIs when you're dealing with kind of offline and just generally semi-connected states. It's, it's handy, it, but in practice, it doesn't work very well. And the, the whole point about this thing as well is that Actually, APIs are only half of the problem, right? We know we've got register protocol handler, we've got register content handler, we've, you know, we've got kind of web intents. We know we need to solve the web intents problem. We're gonna go back to the drawing board and kind of work on some, like, a better solution. Um, but generally, you know, it's, if you're a developer and you're kind of not using the standard mail too, and maybe open and a whole, like, a couple of other different types of well-defined protocols and schemes, well, no one's gonna really start to use your application to actually push data in it. It's really hard to build communities, unless you're large, like a, like a browser vendor, for instance, maybe, and you kind of integrate it into the, like, the browsing experience. It's actually really hard for you to build a brand new ecosystem around your application, how to get data in and out. Um, so my general takeaway is this is one whole kind of chapter of the web that needs to be solved even better than it is now. Um, primarily because if we're building offline applications, and I want you all to build offline applications, we wanna make it super easy for you to get data between those applications. And like I said, we're not in a great place, but I'm actually hopeful, right? I mean, I've taken a hit with the whole idea about web intents, but I'm actually hopeful the problem will get solved pretty quickly. So, experience, and this now is to the part that Remy was talking about, um, is I want you as a developer to build compelling experiences for the user. I'm not necessarily talking about like beautiful user interfaces with user experience, like nice user experience. I'm just talking about, you know, the user has certain idioms that they use and like paradigms that they use on desktops or the devices that they're on to actually get data into native applications. Things like drag and drop, things like selecting directories and all this type of stuff. It's relatively simple stuff and it's been around for a long time, but no one is actually using this in production that much. So, first is download, right? You know, we download a link and we wanna give it a nice name. We just wanna give it a nice name for the user's file system. We don't normally do this, but there's this nice little thing called download equals awesome.png. I believe this is actually is WebKit only at the moment. Um, but it allows you to take this thing, which is images forward slash me.png, and name it to awesome. 
essentially, and the browser will go and do its thing, and it's downloaded. And it's quite nice, it's a nice little API, but it actually lets you um, lose your presentation, uh, for one. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Um, cool, but it'll actually let you do nice things like name the files, right? It's a relatively simple thing, which we don't really get choice to do at the moment. If you wanted to give an app, like your file, a different name to the one that's actually stored, say, on a server, you have to do a whole load of weird stuff like send a request to a server, do like the, the disposition, basically the content disposition to give it a brand new name, and obviously that's not gonna work in an offline scenario, right? Um, create object URL, it's actually a pretty nice API, it's one line of code, window.url.create window <clears throat> object URL, and the idea behind this is that you have a blob of something inside your client side application, your browser, uh, a blob of data, you can't really do much with it, but you wanna be able to link to it, give it an image, you like image source, a whole load of other stuff, but you might wanna say, well this actually, this blob of data which is just a piece of memory inside my application, the user will want to download it and put it onto their desktop for instance. So this is another example, I'm gonna say uh, full, oops, wrong word, <laughs> fullfrontal.txt, create a brand new file, and then using the exact same piece of technology that we used before, you know, the, the, a, uh, the anchor with the, down, the download attribute, we just say, there it is, full frontal, and it's got the same text. It's pretty cool. Now, I'll just explain exactly what's happening inside this a little bit, bit more. Um, it's actually this line of code here, which is the important piece, create object URL. It takes a blob and gives it a URL. By default, blobs are just a memory, like an in-memory representation of binary data. And it just basically gives that a URL, and I could do anything I want with that. I could attach it to an image if it was an image, like an image source. Um, and in this case, I'm just attaching it down, down to the download URL and uh, like inserting that into the DOM. And it gives you this nice way of actually starting to get data out of your application and into the user's you know, operating environment itself. So it's pretty nice, it's pretty cool. Next thing that most people want to do is actually access files that are on the user's physical machine. We don't give you raw access to the whole namespace, like the whole C, like the C colon drive, all that type of stuff. We're not gonna do that on the open web at all for, well, until we solve a whole load of permissions-based problems. But the general idea is that you know, you've got an input type equals file, you've got this element to actually go and select files already from the browser, and then upload it to, like, via a form to some server. Well actually, you wanna be able to access that and interact with that inside your client application, especially if you're offline. So this, again, is pretty simple. It's just a normal input type equals file. Um, in WebKit, at least, you can do WebKit directory if you wanna select an entire directory, but normally, most people just want access to one file. Uh, you listen to the on-change event like you would do for a normal input element, and then you get the list of files out from the source element, and then you can just iterate across it and do whatever you want, which, let's give it a demo. Um, right, full frontal, select, boom. So in this case, I, in this case I'm only uh, showing you the names of the files, the size, because that's an extra piece of metadata that we get access to, and the, and the MIME type as well, if we know the MIME type. It's pretty simple, it's pretty, it's, that's all it is, it's pretty simple. Um, in this case, I've selected a directory. You can basically hold on to this file reference and then start to do some nice stuff with it. And I'll go, I'm gonna show you that a little bit later on. Um, has anyone used drag and drop in Gmail? Yeah, yeah it's pretty nice, right? Um, so I took this screenshot. It's actually really easy to implement. Um, uh, let's find the finder. Oh, you know what? This is gonna be a real pain. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> right, um, yeah, X plus A, X plus A, uh, sorry, wrong one, right, let's give this a go, uh, where is the, oh, it, <laughs> top, top right, there it is, why can't I see that? No. Right, imagine there's magic going on, right? Oh! Thank you. Right. So, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna go out of full screen mode. Right. No, I'm not. It's just not working. Why is this not working? Come on. <laughs> um, You know what, can you trust me that it works? <laughs> yeah, so basically what happens is a nice little piece of JavaScript, this is all that I use, and basically you can detect, obviously, on 
you know, on Dragover, and then you can inspect the number of files that are in kind of collated uh, by the user's cursor, essentially. Um, you can basically find this list of files, and you can't inspect them until the user actually drags and, and drop, does the drop event itself. And that is all the code that I have to actually show you this awesome demo, which I can't show you. Um, but essentially, I just accessed the, on the data transfer object of the event, the list of files, and exactly the same as this previous slide where we're going across that list of files and creating DOM elements, well, that's all we do again. So if you want to replicate this kind of Gmail interface to do, say, picture upload or picture manipulation, you know, anything that you want to do with a file inside your application, you can easily get the data into your app just with that piece of code. Uh, and the rest of the code that you need to create is your, your very app-specific piece of code. <sighs> drag and drop, drag and drop. Uh, full screen, here we go. This is not gonna work again. Right, so imagine that I just dragged a file onto this nice little box at the bottom. Um, what's it gonna do? Well, in the previous demo, it just lists the number of files that you have and the types of files that you have done in the action. That's kind of useless if you can't do anything with the file. Maybe you want to upload it to a file server, and you, know, you can do that quite easily with the, the actual form itself. Um, but you know, if it's a client-side application, especially with no server, like no server to go and talk to because you're offline, you want to do some stuff in the user's client. And you can actually get access to the raw data pretty easily. And I believe File Reader is in um, Chrome. I believe it's in Opera. Uh, is it in Opera? Yep, it's in Opera, it's cool. It's in Firefox, and it's in Internet Explorer 10. But essentially, the file reader allows you to get raw access to the data that's held inside the file, even if it's on the user's file system. And because the user is granted access to your, you know, to access to that file, well, you can't write to it. We're not going to allow write just yet, at least anyway. Um, but you can read it, and you can start to do some nice stuff with it. And if you want to get the data back out, well, we have the drag and drop to go out. We have the ability to create an object URL and actually give the URL. Uh, to the blob, the file that you've just written, and then send it back out to the user's client. So you, we're getting nearly to that point of where you can do that full, take a file in your web application, edit it, and then save it back out. We, we, we are nearly, nearly there, but we've got some nice replacements in between, which I've just shown. Um, Chrome, at least, and WebKit has this idea of a local sandboxed file system. Uh, I'll tell you now, it's a pain to use. Um, but the idea is that you can request access to a sandboxed file system Persistent or temporary storage, you're going to say up front how much data that you need. Um, and that's pretty much it. Once you have that, you can then use the thing called a file writer rather than the file reader to actually save that file out into the user's sandbox file system storage, which is just held on the user's machine. Um, where we've used it and where I've used it in applications is kind of like a, a weird proxy where if you're downloading a whole load of content um, like asynchronously, whether it's a news application, for instance, you download it, you want to store it somewhere, local storage isn't going to be your answer. Um, because of the, well, because of the size constraints just generally. Um, and if you're using images, it's really hard that way. But the general thing is here is that, you know, if you've got lots of data and you've got access to a file system, you can just intercept the, on the onload request of an XML, HTTP, XML HTTP request and save it to the file system. And then when the user refreshes the browser, it's actually still in the file system. You've still got access to it. It's like a database, um, but it's much more like a file system. However, it's hard, and my good, my good friend and colleague, Eric Beidelman, um, made this thing called Filer.js, which basically wraps it up into kind of Unix-like commands for actually accessing files in that HTML5 file system. So you basically do the same type of thing. You initialize the file system. You say whether it's persistent or temporary storage. Uh, temporary storage, by the way, is like the browser will just decide when it wants to clear it out. Uh, if you want to make sure the data's always there, that's when you use the persistent storage, at least. But you can list directories, you know, file.ls. You can move files in between uh, directories just with a CP. Uh, and then to write, rather than do all this kind of, I'm not joking, it's like crazy code. Create a writer, and then you write, and then you have to handle all the other events, or on-write error and on-write end, and it's just call, it's callback hell. You know, this is the inconsistent callback features that I was talking about before. Um, we have a, a little nicer way of doing it, at least, anyway. So you can do file.write, the name of the file and the blob, and it's so much easier to actually work with um, than just the normal file system API. Whoa, five minutes, crap. <laughs> um, so, how do you make it cross-browser? Well, it's kind of interesting. IndexedDB and Mozilla, at least, can support blobs. And so Eric Badelman has also written a file system API which allows you to go between, uh, using the same API, between those different, two different clients. So, building apps for tomorrow, I got some sexy demos. Uh, everyone likes sexy demos, but I also get into trouble for doing it because they're not ready yet. Um, this is actually one of the ones that is kind of ready across browsers. You know, access to webcam, we've never had this before. Uh, Navigator.getusermedia, and I'm speeding up really quickly, I'm sorry. 
Um, Navigator.getUserMedia, uh, you can access for, ask for access to a video stream or an audio stream. And again, create object URL, it takes, takes the stream, gives you the URL, and then you can attach it to a video element. This is all this is. Uh, audio input, right? You can take data from the microphone, today in Chrome at least, put it onto a web audio context, and then you can do a whole load of nice things. Uh, and Chris Wilson is gonna be up later. He's actually got a vocoder demo, which does some really cool stuff with just JavaScript you speaking into the, into the microphone. It's pretty cool. Uh, CSS filters, has anyone seen these? These are pretty cool, right? I'm, I'm terrible at anything graphic related, but you, know, you can basically say this image is gonna have a blur of so many pixels radius and grayscale, and then you can do nice things like animate in between, the different, in between the different states. Great thing is if the browser doesn't support it, well, your application's still gonna display the video and everything, it's just not gonna do the transitions uh, or actually have the blur effect. Uh, CSS shaders, has anyone seen these? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll be honest, Paul Lewis did all this demo for me because I have no idea what to do with WebGL and shaders. Um, but the idea is that you can take all the, all, the, all the knowledge that you know and create beautiful, like all the knowledge that we've accumulated about OpenGL and graphical transformations uh, and do some nice things, like if this works. There we are, Wee! And that's not a video element, I'm lying. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a div. Um, there's a bug in Chrome which doesn't let you uh, do, do things with already accelerated content. But, you know, you can hack around it, it's pretty cool. And then you can do just do normal transitions and animations to actually get this nice, beautiful effect. So it's pretty cool. Um, WebRTC, again, no code. The reason why is I don't like the API, but, and it's too hard to explain here, but the idea is you can take a video, normal video element on the canvas, or not on the canvas, on the video, call someone, and the problem is I've got no internet connection, so offline web, yeah. <laughs> uh, but imagine what normally happened here is actually I would, I would appear on the other side of uh, this and you can do whatever you want. You can basically do Skype inside the browser. It's pretty cool. So I have one last thing to show you. Uh, I'm going to be really, really quick and it's a new platform that we're working on inside Chrome. Um, I'm going to be honest, it is very much Chrome only, but we are working towards this idea of standardization, but standardization takes a very, very long time. Um, why are we doing it? Well, why we're doing this is because we want to solve all the problems that we've been talking about today. We want applications to be offline by default. The developer's mental model is, I'm gonna make an application that integrate online functionality into it, regardless of connection state. Uh, and then we'll get, we, you, know, we, you know, you use the web for its good things of like, comp like computation in the cloud and a whole load of other stuff, and you bring that into your application. Uh, we want our applications to look and feel native, and if you saw me failing completely at drag and drop before, you probably would have seen this demo in the background. Um, let me just hit go here. This is an application. We, uh, it's a markdown editor, so, uh, Hello, uh, full frontal, there we go. You know, it's a markdown editor, and I wanna show you something cool. It's, uh, this was only like five or six lines of code. Uh, so for me, it was pretty cool and pretty easy to create. I spent more time, and Paul Lewis will attest to this, actually trying to style the thing up. Um, and our application should be able to access native APIs, right? We, you know, we talked about not being able to write directly to a file that the user's actually just giving you, you, know, giving you access to. Well, we wanna make sure that you can write, actually you know, do that whole cycle of Take your file and save it back out. Uh, we want to give you access to network sockets. You've got access to network sockets. You can do really cool things with AR drones and a whole load of other stuff. And we've got a demo for this. Uh, serial ports, USB and Bluetooth, all the types of things that you'll want access to as a more native app developer. Now, our application should be secure by default. We know that there's a lot of problems with just generally on the web with cross-site scripting. We don't want someone to cross-site script a native looking app. Uh, so we use CSP by default. And we basically say, you know, don't let any resources in from any non-whitelisted, developer whitelisted resources. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not introducing new technology, like new technology into the whole stack. We want our application to be written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, all the things that you love. And, you know, on the point of access to hardware, I hope, I hope you really like this. You can now do web servers in the browser. Um, I know Opera's been able to do this for a while. Um, but this is actually me just coding up. And if I do it correctly, and I know I've only got like 20 seconds left, this is my web server that's serving my content. And I'm gonna give you the full URL to my, my website, uh, to this presentation, but everything's being served locally off this, pulled in from the local file system and done some really nice stuff. Um, let me just get back to this. The last thing I wanna talk about, and I think it's gonna be cool, uh, it's just a socket. Uh, you just ask for it, it's a POSIX socket. It's actually really hard to program. Um, and there's lots of code. Uh, this, is all the, this is only like a quarter of the code that I needed to make my basic web server. Um, so my question is, can we use an existing ecosystem, right, that's built on JavaScript, maybe, I don't know, using V8 type of engine before and has got millions of modules kind of living outside in the web? Like Node, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, there's been a whole lot of work done um, called Browserify, which takes Node modules, 
brings them into the browser. Uh, I didn't do any of the work on this. I fixed a bug or two, but that's about it. Uh, it's been done by Substact. Uh, um, but basically, we've take, taken NPM modules, brought them into the browser. The markdown editor is not doing anything special, so it, you just have to do require markdown, bring it into your app, and then handle the key presses to translate the data. That, that was actually pretty much my very first version of the app that you saw before. Um, and I'm so, just so glad that kind of existed. So one of the thing I did was, obviously, Browserify doesn't come with a net module or a HTTP proper, like, full-on module, because normal browsers don't have access to web, so, like, to normal, proper, native, raw sockets. Uh, so I wrote down a module which basically says convert, basically, net. It's, it's the net module in NPM. Uh, I, so I wrote that, which then I let IceDev, they're based in Atlanta. I need to go and speak to them and say thank you for this. But um, the, off a video that they watched of me showing you the basic net module, they made the HTTP module, which means with like four or five lines of code inside your Chrome application, you can essentially create a HTTP web server. It's pretty cool, and it's pretty powerful. Uh, and that's pretty much the end of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I want people to do a lot of awesome stuff. Uh, I think we've got the technology inside the browser, even ignoring the whole Chrome Apps thing. We've got a lot of technology in the browser to deliver and build great, compelling web applications that work offline and interact with the user's, you know, the user's mental model of interacting with applications natively on the desktop. And if you want to, obviously, you can build drones. Um, watch this video. Obviously, we're offline, so we can't do it. Um, but we go and attack another Googler um, because we lost complete control of the drone. And he had to run, and he was scared. And it was all done in JavaScript. It was pretty cool. <laughs> but go, if you can, go and try and watch the video. Um, it's just a nice overview of what we're doing. And I'd like to say thank you, and I'm sorry for overrunning. So.